Hey everybody, how's it going? Happy Friday. Thanks for joining us today. We have a really, really good one on deck. All right, who do we got with us so far? Rodolfo, Suresh, Maddie, Paul, Rita, Lockie, Moes, Moz, R Rory, Christophe, Simone. Welcome, welcome. It's like we got a lot of folks from over the over the pond today, which is really, really awesome. Baton, um, Ivan, Martin, Steve. Hey, Steve, how's it going? Peter, nice to see you again. Baraf, Joy. Hey, Joy, nice to see you. Got some folks from Germany. We got Zedin from Syria. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. All right. I am from Israel. Marcin. Marcin. Brad, nice to see you again, Brad. All right, all. So uh, let's let's kick right into it today and, and talk a little bit about what we're gonna be uh, what we're gonna be going over. Um, this is a really exciting topic. We were kind of thinking through what we wanted to do this week and bouncing some ideas around. And George said, "Hey, you know, people have been talking about you know admission control and open policy agent a lot lately." And was and we were thinking, "Wow, we should revisit that." And if you weren't aware, Joe actually did a, a talk or a, I should say a TGIK on OPA. I think it was about a, a little over a year ago, um, back when it was still a little bit fresher in the ecosystem. At least I should say in the ecosystem of Kubernetes. Um, and he set up uh, set up OPA, did some basic stuff, and we're going to expand on that today. So really excited to be uh, to be joining you all today. Um, so. Let's see who else do we got we got duffy too here to here to support um very cool and as well um for special guests we've got rita and locky joining us from microsoft and they're close to the gatekeeper project so they'll be uh they'll be helping us out with questions and telling you when i'm lying to you when i get something wrong so this should be a, a really good setup thanks so much for joining us today you two i uh, really appreciate it all right um so let's go ahead and get right into the core today. Um, let me just set up my screen here. Cool, all right, I'm good. All right, so what do we got going on this week? Uh, Kubernetes patch releases are coming out, 118.3. I looked through some of them briefly. It looked like there was some interesting stuff with GCP, and, or I should say uh, Google Google Cloud, uh, and a little, a couple things around storage with Azure. So if you're running in either of those environments, maybe check out the patch release, make sure you're staying on top of that. We got one for 118, 117, and 116. Uh, George has kindly put in a link to the monthly Kubernetes uh, meeting and there's a great video in here with some some different notes so be sure to check those out um, some of the kind of big highlights 119.0 beta 0 uh, it went out on may 19th so pretty exciting feature freeze is coming up uh, so those of you or i should say um, enhancement freeze was on end of day tuesday may 19th i can't keep my days straight anymore um, and there's some interesting stuff around patch releases one of the things I did like about this update when I was scrolling through it is he's got links to all of the slides for some of the different SIGs. So check out the slides. They're kind of, uh, well, maybe not that one. I don't know why that one didn't work. They were working. There we go. Uh, it has just some kind of high level details about what's going on with these different SIGs. Thought it was super interesting. So do check that out. And if you haven't already, check out the community meeting recording inside of our HackMD. All right. Um, let's see. Who else do we have joining us here? Cool, cool. Patrick, welcome Patrick. We got cool. And we got Paul joining us as well to help out. Thanks so much for joining us, Paul. All right. Uh, community stuff that's going on. Harbor 2.0 is released. Um, this kind of flew under the radar for me, but I'm pretty stoked about it. Uh, cool things around the fact that they're really leaning into being the first open source OCI compliant registry. Um, you know, obviously the most important thing that any of us care about is there's a dark mode now because that's the that's the most business critical thing to include. But in all seriousness, um, it supports Helm charts now. It supports uh, OPA policy, which is kind of great timing for us. Um, you can bundle OPA policy um, if you've used like conf test and things. We'll talk a bit about that. So really, really cool. Um, so yeah, just some better support for different object types, better support for OCI. Uh, compliant images, and they're using the Aqua, uh, is it Trivi, is that how you say it, um, as the kind of vulnerability scanner. So that's really exciting. Um, I know a couple folks who use that, um, and it seems to be getting a lot of traction. Um, you know, coming from my old days at CoreOS, I still have a, a love for Claire, but uh, Aqua's Trivi is, is really cool. So that's, that's some exciting stuff with Harbor. Um, 
this one's kind of out of the blue, but uh, it got me really excited. Um, I'm a I'm a hardcore Vim user, and not because I love Vim or really care what text editor I use. I'm just used to it, and I've been really pushing off VS Code for a really long time now. Um, the nice thing about the advent of VS Code is I feel like it really pushed the language server protocol forward. So I've been able to keep using Vim and kind of take advantage of a lot of the VS Code oriented features. But some of these really cool plugins are, are just kind of catching my attention. So I'm forcing myself to use VS Code, including today, because someone released a Draw.io integration. So we use Draw.io on my team a lot to do like really quick diagramming. So the idea that I can be in my editor writing code and doing diagrams at the same time is pretty freaking sweet. So that has me really, really excited. Um, if you're a draw, draw IO user, check that out. Kind of random, but pretty cool. Um, speaking of cool things that uh, people are doing in the Microsoft ecosystem, um, Nuno, uh, Karma, hopefully, and Ihor, Ihor uh, I'm not going to try the last name there, put up a post on setting up Kind and Minikube on WSL2 Ubuntu. So as if there's not already really awesome stuff going on with WSL2, uh, this is a really good Kubernetes-focused kind of view into how you can get some of those common environments set up that we're used to. So if you've ever watched Duffy, um, Duffy do a TGIK, you know he likes Kind a lot, right? So uh, this is a cool thing that to uh, this is a cool thing to check out. Um, lots of cool stuff in in this space, and it's just really exciting to see how uh, how much. Microsoft is embracing this ecosystem. Um, so that's really, really cool. Check out that blog post. And then uh, Clay, uh, Kay, Kay Lent, Kay Lent, um, they have a post on using OPA uh, that they posted up from their company. Now, I'm not going to talk much about this because I don't want them to steal our thunder. But if you leave this kind of wondering, hey, uh, what are companies doing with or what's their experience with things like Gatekeeper and OPA and so on and so forth? You should check this out. I, I breezed through it, thought it was pretty cool. Um, but again, I'm not going to I'm not going to let them steal our thunder here. OK, uh, so uh, and then the last thing we'll say is um, hugs to all the folks that are working on the Quay uh, key Quay outage. Um, I know that was a, that was an intense one, but I think I think all systems might be back up. So uh, so that's that's cool as well. All right. What else do we have? Yeah, that's exactly why Duffy is kind of a big deal. Exactly. Vivian, thanks for joining us from uh, Munich. Glad to have you. Thanks so much. And Paul C., you probably heard me mention it. Um, but yeah, like as far as the the default one, I think they're using um, I think they're using uh, the the Aqua the Aqua Trivi. Oh, Joe said right under you, it's pluggable. So that's kind of cool. But Trivi's the default. Okay, I just got to read lower in the chat, and I can answer my own my own questions there. All right, so yeah, we have a great audience today. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's get right into it. So as mentioned previously, um, Joe did, about a year ago, a thing on OPA. And there's a lot of stuff that has kind of been going on in this ecosystem. I think people are really excited about it. And I think one thing we could do to, to tell the story a little bit here is maybe, um, maybe just kind of level set, right? I'm thinking like, our focus today is going to be more about like some of the new stuff. Like we're going to get into Gatekeeper, we're going to look into contests and all that stuff. But it'd be helpful to build on what Joe had did in the last TGIK, and I, I watched that before this one, um, and just talk a little bit about what's the bigger picture with admission control? Why is it important? Right? How does OPA play a role in here? And then that will lead us very gracefully into uh, talking about Gatekeeper and constraint templates and all all these cool things that we're going to get into. So how's that sound, everyone? I think that should be a pretty pretty solid episode here. So, um, speaking of that draw IO integration, let's let's draw some stuff out here real quick. So we'll call this one one nine dot draw IO. Um, I think this is the extension it wants, right? All right, cool. So, what are we talking about today, right? So um, there's this concept of uh, of admission control that that we care a lot about, and the question really is like, why do we care about admission control? So one of the one of the interesting things that I have a lot of conversations around, and, and you'll get a lot of opinions depending on who you ask, is like, you know, what what's the difference between Kubernetes versus like Cloud Foundry versus like OpenShift, you know, versus all these these interesting things, and kind of a, a metaphor that I use uh, when I when I talk to folks about it, um, and sometimes they love it, sometimes they don't, is that Kubernetes is a little bit like. Um, I'm going to bring a graphic in here real quick if I can. 
Kubernetes is a little bit like, ooh, that's a tiny graphic. It's a little bit like a motherboard, right? Um, and, and what am I getting at here? So like a lot of a lot of kind of platforms as a service, like even like Heroku and stuff like that, there may be a little bit more like uh, kind of a fully baked out iMac uh, from Apple that you would buy. And the iMac is like this this cool machine, right? And it, uh, well, then that's a much bigger picture. Um, let's bring this one down here a little bit. All right, let's see if I can zoom out. So a little squished iMac here, right? Um, so you use some of these kind of platforms as a service and they've got everything baked in, right? A lot of times, you know, they might just say, hey, as long as your app conforms to running in this ecosystem, you can run it here, right? And then one of the interesting things about Kubernetes when you put some of these things side by side is it's a little bit more like a motherboard in the sense that we have like this kind of uh, this orchestrator, if you will, of things, which is pretty rad, right? And then we have all these specifications where we can plug in the right thing. So we've got like CRI for storage and we've got like, uh, sorry, not CRI for storage, CRI for runtime, right? Which I probably should put by the processor. Yeah, there we go. How's that? CRI. We've got CSI for, um, we've got CSI for storage. We've got CNI for networking on and on and on. And one of the cool things about Kubernetes is like, just like a motherboard where you've got PCI express and dim slots and all these SATA and all these specifications, you get to leverage this kind of foundation, the substrate, if you will, to then build a platform that fits your needs, right? But it's very composable over time. Um, the, the big thing we've got to be honest with is usually Kubernetes is really, I guess it's, it's really just a container orchestrator, right? It, it, it's at its purest and, and it's got, it does more than that. So don't hate me for just calling it a container orchestrator. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's one piece of the puzzle that does its job really well. But eventually, we want to add all these things in so we can build something that looks a little bit closer to this, right? That's kind of where we want to get to. So the reason I'm bringing this up is one of these things that we oftentimes have to plug in to take a Kubernetes and make it something that's like viable to run our workloads and, and run our applications is admission control. It's a super common day two conversation that we have um, when we're talking to folks about how they're going to set up their Kubernetes environment. And that's really what we're going to get into today. So just to kind of lay the ground with admission control and, and what we mean by it, and then we're going to get right into OPA and Gatekeeper. So as all of us know, or I, I think most of us might know, Kubernetes has this thing. It calls it the API server, right? And then inside of the API server, see if I can put this text up top, Inside of the API server, we've got some different things that happen when a request comes through, right? One of the things we have that happens is the um, you're, you're authorized to some degree, right? Uh, your identity. Um, uh, you're authenticated, I should say. And then, like, maybe, like, it, it checks your RBAC and things like that. And by the way, this isn't a technically accurate flow for an API server, but just, just bear with me. There's kind of, like, these chains of things that happen when a human talks to the API server through something like kubectuddle, yeah? So here's our human, and here's the arrow into the API server, and we go through this kind of chain of things and blah, blah, blah. Now, there is this kind of larger box in here that I'm gonna call, um, and I'll just keep it small, I guess, that we'll call the admission control, right? And some of you might be aware that um, admission controllers have been in Kubernetes for a while, right? Like if we were to go to uh, a cluster real quick, um, if I were to hop onto a master node and I were to look into uh, the Kube API server, which since this is a Kube admin based deployment, um, it's going to be uh, inside of static pods. So let's just go here. So this will be Etsy. Kubernetes manifest cube API server. There we go. There is uh, this this flag called enable admission control, uh, admission plugins. You Some of you might even remember back in the day where there used to be a different flag here and there was like tons of things we'd chain in here and the order mattered and, and all this kind of stuff, right? Does anyone remember that from back in the day? So admission controls can be things where we kind of say like, hey, do this extra check to validate whether the request that's coming through should actually be allowed. So that, that does make sense. Um, so we'll go through into RBAC and do some amount of admission control, right? Now, yeah, we've repressed those memories, right, Paul? Now, the, these ones that I'm talking about, I'm going to call entry admission controls, right? Where they're baked into the API server. They're kind of in the code base, if you will, right? 
So what's interesting about the type of admission control we're going to be talking about here is that it's a little bit different. We're going to be talking about the notion of dynamic admission control, uh, di dynamic admission control, where the notion is rather than having this kind of uh, entry flag, if you will, that we turn on and enable in the API server, we instead use the notion of webhooks to call out, invalidate whether the thing that we're asking to do should be allowed. So let's call this the validating awesome controller. And sometimes you'll hear these be called controllers, like validating webhook controllers. I get a little confused by that name um, just because like they don't usually seem like controllers to me. They don't seem to be reconciling. I guess in a way they're reconciling, but to me, it's more like a, a web service in a way. Um, maybe I'm getting too pedantic there, but long story short, we get to call out from the API server to some service that's running, right? And this is great for a couple reasons, and, and maybe Joe can even uh, enlighten us on the history if there's more to it. But one reason it's great is we don't have to pack the API server with as much entry logic, right? The second reason it's great, and this this has really been beneficial, obviously, to like the cloud providers of the world. You have AKS and GKE and EKS, and the control plane is largely not known to you, right? So like, I'm not super up to date with how well they support these models, but the notion that you could set up your own validating hook and then have the control plane call out to your ad administration logic without having to touch the API server, because remember in those models, you don't always have the, uh, the access to them, is really beneficial, right? And you know, long story short, when you go from, again, that motherboard to that, that computer, your organization is kind of starting to take workloads on, right? And they're starting to realize, oh my gosh, we really need to be making sure people aren't asking for 90,000 gigabytes of memory when they schedule their pod. Oh my gosh, we need to make sure that this team isn't asking for this ingress URI because all of a sudden they're taking over our production homepage, right? So it's it's super interesting um, and it's a, it's a really cool space. Now, there's another uh, kind of facet to this dynamic stuff you might have heard of, which is um, the uh, mutating. Uh, controller. We did the secret management secret management one pretty recently where we looked at Vault, which used a, um, a mutating controller to call out and um, instantiate a uh, instantiate, what was it again? It was an injector pod, right? So the mutating webhook would come through, it put a sidecar in. Those of you who have used Istio have probably seen this where you go through and it injects Istio. Today, our focus is mostly going to be validating, but it's kind of a similar model where you can call out to a web service and you can do some type of logic, right? And that's kind of the key thing here. All right. So what do we got going on in chat? Japal, thanks for joining us. Glad to have you. All right. Hey, Brian, thanks for joining us. Haven't seen you in a while. All right. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Now, the last thing I'll say here before we, before we dive a little bit into OPA is... There's a couple ways you can implement this thing, right? Um, in fact, if we just kind of look really quick at the, uh, let's go back to my browser here where I was looking up pictures of computer parts to show you all. Um, if we go to Google and we type in Kubernetes admission review, I can never remember the object name. Hopefully it shows up here. Um, dynamic admission review. Let's see if I can find it. Um, there it is. Ooh, it's got comments in the JSON. Interesting. Okay, whatever. So Kubernetes can send out this object that we'll take a quick look at, um, which is called the. Let's bring. Let's let's save this one in here. This will be a good one for us to have. And I'll, I'll commit all these diagrams and samples after the episode. By the way, so this will be the admission. I guess it's a JSON file with comments in it for reasons I don't understand, but it's, it's nice because it documents it well. So Kubernetes is gonna be able to send out this uh, admission review object, okay? So remembering that our diagram kind of looks like this, you're, the question is what comes out of the API server and eventually hits our little web service? Well, at the end of the day, it's, a, it's kind of a, a object that's wrapping the object or resource we submitted that's all converted into JSON here, right? You got some details about like, what's the operation you wanted to do? You've got uh, details about like what the actual object was and all that good stuff. So the crux that we have here is, can we take this admission review object that we get, do some level of validation on it, 
and then send back, and this will be the second object I'll, I'll be sure to save in here. Um, we'll call this one, um, these names aren't great, but let's call this the admission response uh, JSON file. So we do whatever we want, right? And then eventually we send this thing back to the API server that looks like this, okay? So the key thing that we've got to have our heads wrapped around before we get into OPA and Gatekeeper, right, is we get in some admission review object, and then we need to respond with something here to the API server that's like, hey, API server, looked over the thing. Here's how I'm feeling about it. <laughs> you should allow it or you should not allow it. And the beauty here is what we implement this in is largely up to us, right? So we could implement this in Bash in a container. We could write this in Go in Python. And of course, per today's conversation, we could write this in, uh, oops, that's my face. We could write this in or using OPA. So OPA allows us to kind of centralize uh, policy management. And OPA is not like a Kubernetes specific thing, right? It just got adapted and got a lot of adoption in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So if you want to see how to set up OPA just as like generic in Kubernetes, you run the OPA service, you link it into the admission controller I was just talking about, check out Joe's other episode. He sets that up in a, in a mini cube cluster, okay? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to try to take this a step further and talk a little bit about how Gatekeeper um, takes this kind of one step further for us, right? So if we look at, um, let's look at the policy language real quick. I think, uh, I think this would be kind of a, a good thing to point out before we get too, too deep. The open policy agent, rather than you writing a bunch of custom, again, controllers or web services to do some logic, enables you to write these policy files called Rago. And if, again, if you watch Joe's other episode, the crux of the episode is he learns it's pronounced Rago. So now you all know that if you didn't. Uh, the Rago is a DSL that lets you query things and give a result. Now, I've, I've worked with OPA a lot in the field. I've never worked with Gatekeeper. I'm super excited about today because of that. Um, but I've worked with OPA quite a bit in the field. And um, a lot, mostly people like it. But the biggest complaint I get is, oh my gosh, why did they make another language? This Rago thing, it sounds like a pasta sauce. And also, um, I, I'm just like super confused by it. And I do have some empathy for that because when you look at the Rago language, in fact, let's just, let's just throw a quick Rago file in here. So we'll say uh, policy.rago, right? It looks kind of like, um, it looks kind of like, in fact, let me switch back over to here. It looks kind of like a, uh, a weird kind of like function definition in a way, right? So if I do this real quick, okay, and put that here, all right? A lot of times, in, in fact, let's, let's see the, the version that you all probably see a lot because some of you have probably seen conf test. You'll see this thing that kind of looks like this, right? And when I read this thing, I'm like, okay, so I am taking an argument called message and I'm doing logic and then I'll return a value, right? And that's just because my brain is so focused on like, you know, structured typed programming, right? And I think the key thing with Rago that we have to keep in mind as we get deeper into some of these policy examples is that it's a, it's a language that lets you query, right? Um, and those queries are effectively assertions. And, you know, so, so when you're using Rego, when you, if, you're, if you're like me and get confused, you, every time you wake up in the morning, you just got to remind yourself, Rego is not a general purpose language. It is, uh, it is for querying data, right? And then you choose what to do with that result set. So let's use like a, a really simple example really quickly. Uh, and then we'll, then we'll deploy Gatekeeper and test it out there. So um, here's, here's where I'll get the example from. Because we're going we're gonna to come to conf test later. So let's go ahead and just look up conf test, um, which by the way, just got moved into the open policy agent repository. Um, so let's just take something kind of random that makes sense to us Kubernetes users real quick, okay? So we'll go, we'll go to here, all right? And let's take this sample policy. Um, you know, in fact, let's keep it even simpler than this one. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take their second example here, all right? So we'll get that. Let me close this out. All right. So 
And then we just need some kind of uh, some kind of YAML file that we can um, that we can pull from. So let's see uh, let's see if they've got an example here real quick. So Kubernetes uh, deployment YAML. This seems pretty good. Great. This is fantastic. All right. So we'll grab this. Maybe we'll grab it. Apparently the raw is not taking is taking long. So let's go here. We will grab a manifest. We'll put a file in here, and we'll just call this example. Example.yaml. All right, cool. We'll do that. All right. So, looking a little bit closer at here, right? Um, this is a YAML file that we'd submit, right? Sorry, I keep uh, keep screwing up my uh, my different screen. So, this is a YAML file we'd submit, and when it gets to Rego. Oh, sorry, when it gets to OPA, it's going to be in a, a JSON format, right? So let's go ahead and make that change really quick. So um, I will do, and I'm still learning how to use VS Code, so bear with me here. Uh, YAML to JSON selection or document. Yep, there we go. All right. So we'll save this, and then we will call it example.json, which probably would have been the move up front, but that's okay. We're learning here, all right? Uh, example, actually, it needs to be uh, input.json, I think. Um, so I'm using a plugin in VS Code that's going to evaluate this. So let's see if this even works. Um, okay, so clean up here a little bit. There's our admission control. There's the response we need to give. There's the policy. Um, okay, this is good. And then I'll open up the input one more time too. Great, all right. So. We've got this policy here, right? So the idea is if I run this thing, right, against this deployment, what is it going to come up with? So um, so what are we checking for here, right? So what we're saying is not inside of the match labels that there is a label called app. So let's look inside of here under spec. Oh, wait, one spec up. Under spec, under match labels, there is app. So in theory, this policy should work okay. So in other words, we'd expect this to evaluate as if it's not there, then it would be true. So it is there, so it would be false. <laughs> and then there's this is actually another check here. This is this is one of the things that gets kind of really confusing um, with OPA is there's different interpretations of the equal sign depending on the context. Um, they've kind of gotten around this. I, I'm guessing they've kept the, equ the single equal sign methodologies around for backwards compatibility, but um, you can actually do this here, which I think makes a lot more sense. So this evaluation is going to say, is this a deployment? Now, in this case, we'd expect uh, this to evaluate as true, right? So when we run this, uh, this rule here, this will evaluate as true. This will evaluate as false. So first, let's just go ahead and see... If I run this, uh, evaluate package. Okay, so this uh, VS Code plugin has run the OPA against here, and it's basically said, "Hey, you, you, uh, you haven't been denied." Let's put it that way, right? Now, keep in mind, deny is extremely arbitrary, right? You have to keep in mind that OPA, or sorry, Rego, I should say, is this general purposey DSL for doing these types of queries on structured data. So how we interpret the results and what meaning deny has behind it, right? Um, that is completely arbitrary and up to us. So if we call this G, right, and then run the policy one more time, we're going to see a result set with G. It's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a meaningless thing. In this message thing, if we get rid of it for a moment, um, we'll talk a bit about that. Um, we can just run G as is without this kind of this message return. So let's go back to deny to something that's a little bit more familiar. All right. And let's let's take a look at kind of what these pieces are. So this effectively would be allowed. Now, what if we wanted to say, OK, inside of the deployment under metadata labels, you need to have a label called um, dog uh, or pet. Let's let's say pet for now. Um, so what we can do here is we could say input dot metadata, right, dot labels, and then dog. So basically, we're saying here, um, if, uh, if dog is not here, this should trigger, okay? Or, or I should actually say that this block is true. 
So think about this for a moment. If we put true here, because we know dog doesn't exist in here. Dog is not a label, right? So with true and true, okay, when we run this thing, um, we should get, I'm expecting a message there actually. If not labels.dog, did I save that? Let me make sure I save that up. Okay, I didn't save. That was about to kill my sanity for a second. In this case, we're denied, okay? And how this kind of works is we're setting this variable, right? So we got the true, we got the true. In the other case, when we got to false, I don't know if this is actually true from like the back end of OPA, but I kind of think of it like we stopped right here, okay? And we didn't bother going any further because this block wasn't true. So as far as this is concerned, it's just going to kind of, I, I call it exit. It's probably not the right way to put it, but it's going to kind of exit and just be like, all right, continue on, right? But in this case, we said, hey, if this expression evaluates is true and this expression evaluates is true, set message to say this thing, okay? In message, again, it's using that equal sign thing there. Um, the, the kind of, I think, better way to put it is like this. Um, it's kind of like if you've used Go before, it, it shows that you're actually instantiating a value, or at least in this case, setting a value. So we're getting that, and when we run the evaluate package, we get our failure, which is great, okay? And then, of course, if we came in to our output.json, or sorry, our input.json, and we added in the dog label, did I end up doing dog or pet? I did dog, okay, dog exists, all right. I can then go in here and run this again. And if you look at it now, this should evaluate as false, right? Because dog does exist, okay? So again, in my mind, it might not be a technically correct explanation. It's just how I think of it. We stop here and exit <laughs> is, is my very procedural programming mindset. So we shouldn't actually get a denial here in this case. So let's go ahead and run it. And the deny array is blank. So I think the key thing to kind of drive home here is that, and we can, we can set up a, a bunch of these, by the way. We can set up a bunch of these deny things and kind of create a larger block of these rules. But the key thing to, to understand is it's very, very generic, right? We look at some data. This, we just happen to be using a Kubernetes object, but this could be any JSON data. It could be any structured data that, that Rego or OPA can evaluate. And we're just basically checking like, hey, is this field set? Does it have this type of field? Um, you know, there's, there's things in the syntax for how you can kind of iterate over certain things and, and look up values that you iterate over. You know, and that, at that point, it's just kind of like a syntactical exercise. But the crux here is to know that what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, if all the things evaluate to true in this block, in our case, we will deny the message. And if one of any of them respond as false, we will exit. So what I'm trying to say here in way too many words is that these expressions are basically anded together, right? So the, the first check, right, is anded with the second check, okay? And it's basically as we continue to add expressions, it will be anded, 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 wherein we either have to go all true or if one of any are false, we will then again just continue on. Um, and that's kind of it. So what do you think, chat? Does that, does that, are you kind of grokking Rego? Does that kind of make some amount of sense? L let me know. Let me know if it's still a little confusing. You can be, you can be honest. Um, so check chat again. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, Duffy put up the playground they have, by the way. So do check that out. Um, yeah, John, you see Pascal with that expression, right? All right. Yes, okay. I didn't catch the conversation that happened higher, but Brad's conversation about Pascal wrapping it is totally right. So yeah, Maz, if it, if it looks confusing initially, I hear you. Uh, trust me, like I, I struggle with it too. Don't worry, just keep in mind it's running assertions against structured data and, and just keep telling yourself that. And then I think the moment will come where it'll just, the light will go on. Okay. Um, yeah. And st yeah, Steve, the defensive programming model. I think that's a good, that's, that's a good way to articulate it too. I, that makes sense. Um, and Paul C said, so if I'm going to use, if I'm getting it right, Rego is a language to validate JSON and the validation results are a JSON document themselves. Exa yeah. That's a great way to put it, Paul. I think you hit on one of the most important parts. 
this output, it doesn't have any meaning. And that's one of the beauties of Rego. You make the systems that take this output and determine what the meaning is overall, right? So in the case of Gatekeeper, it has a bunch of ways to actually understand the result and then respond back, which is super, super slick, right? In the case of just pure OPA, if, if you've ever done like raw OPA in Kubernetes before Gatekeeper existed, basically what we would do is the message we would respond with was actually, of course I didn't save it. Um, here, I have it right here, I think. Uh, it was actually this chunk of text, um, right? So effectively, if you think about this, this is what correlates to our deny field because this object has meaning to Kubernetes, right? This object, where the heck is it at? This object has no meaning to Kubernetes, right? So what we're gonna do is now we're gonna build on this general purpose thing where we can effectively go in and start building. And with that, let's talk about Gatekeeper. So I had mentioned that you can run Gatekeeper uh, and there's this little thing called cube MGMT or management. Uh, check it out. Check it out in our other TGIK. But long story short, how that works is it's just running generic OPA in cube. So the legwork you have to do here is going in and setting up the things to make the, the response, just like you had mentioned us, uh, Paul C., uh, making the response mean something to Kubernetes. In short, you got to tell uh, OPA, hey, respond with this JSON data, right? Now, Speaking to our friend Gatekeeper, let's do a quick uh, quick check for Gatekeeper here. Gatekeeper is our way. Um, so Gatekeeper team, if I butcher if I butcher this description, you're welcome to to add context here. But I think of this as a way to bring OPA to Kubernetes in a more Kubernetes native way. Um, so Gatekeeper is, in my opinion, and, and I've, I've only looked over the readme, so like we'll figure out if my opinions are right or not. It seems easier to deploy. It seems more Kubernetes native because it's driven by uh, putting the policies in CRDs, where last I checked with OPA when I was working with a customer, um, we were actually setting them up in config maps and having OPA kind of slurp them up. So in this case, we get to use kind of all CRD-based flows. And we also get to use this thing called a constraint template, um, which I am super stoked about conceptually. I've never tried it, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But don't let those details get you too thrown off yet. Let's just get Gatekeeper deployed to start off with. So we're going to roll in Gatekeeper and think of this as something that is wrapping OPA and providing uh, more Kubernetes native functionality uh, with it. All right, so let's, let's deploy it now. So installation instructions, there is a kubectl apply. Let's start off by just getting the YAML in VS code just so that you all have a point in time if you're watching this video in the future. Um, so we'll put this one in manifest, okay? New file, um, this will be gatekeeper.yaml, great. <laughs> I copied the URL, of course. I'm used to W getting. This is where my, my, my Vim workflow and uh, my, uh, my VS Code workflow is a little different. I'm sure there's ways to, to do that automatically in VS Code. But anyways, this is what I meant to use. So let's look at it. All right, so this is the Gatekeeper YAML. Um, I'm just going to, I don't I don't think we need to go over the CRD and stuff, but let's just talk about it. So it's going to instantiate a namespace, looks kosher. Uh, it's probably going to set up a bunch of custom resource definitions. Looks like they generate the controller using Cube Builder. That's pretty cool. If you're not familiar with Cube Builder, that's a way to instantiate controllers. Um, and what else do we got here? Um, thank you, M, for clearing our chat up there. <laughs> um, CRDs, cool, cool, cool. Looks good, looks good. Um, custom resource definitions, good deal. I'm just going to find kind of the core probably deployment. Of course, there's RBAC stuff. We won't get too deep into that. There's a role binding service. Okay, so here's where we're getting into some of the meat and potatoes, right? So we deploy a service, all right? Um, looks pretty simple. It's fronting the gatekeeper webhook, which I'm guessing is, okay. So there's a deployment called audit. Okay. Yes. I remember hearing about this with gatekeeper. I haven't actually checked it out, but I think there's two components here. Um, where did I put my gatekeeper page? 
Uh, here, let's let's bring it up one more time. Oh, this is it. So there is the um, the core kind of I think I'm guessing it's the the kind of webhook controller. We'll we'll take a look soon. Yes, and then there's this audit functionality. So I think that's what this is. It looks like audit is something that can actually go in and retroactively see if there's misconfigurations. Keep me honest, chat. So that's that's a pretty common ask I get. It's like if uh, if OPA happens exclusively, or sorry, I should just say if admission control happens exclusively at the API server level, what if something already exists in the cluster and it's non-compliant, or somehow it drifts some magical way and gets away from the API server and doesn't get checked? Like, how could I go in and audit over time? Which makes a lot of sense. And another big thing with audit is like, oh my gosh, I'm scared to add this new policy in. Um, could I audit the cluster to see what impacts it might have? And I don't know if the audit could do that use case, but that's a really common one I get with OPA all the time. All right, so there's that. Um, let's go back to our YAML. There's audit. Uh, there it is. Okay, so this is the controller manager I'm guessing is kind of the primary gatekeeper maybe. Um, so that seems kind of cool. Um, Certix, you said you could run um, audit as dry run. So I'd be curious, would audit ever act on something? Because when I hear audit, I think like it'll tell you things are misconfigured, but like audit, I'm guessing it won't kill pods or anything, right? I would, I would assume so at least. Okay, and here's another, here's another big one too. Validating webhook configuration, okay? So remember when we were talking about this, we said dynamic admission control, can find a way to send objects to this. Now, the question is, well, what's Kubernetes gonna do? Send every single freaking object to the admission controller, right? Well, no, what you do is you configure one of these validating webhook configs, and this is basically gonna say, hey, take this, um, take this object, move it, uh, move it through into uh, Gatekeeper in this case. And how it does that is it'll let you choose the APIs you care about. So it looks like the default for Gatekeeper is create an update on any object. It looks like that's what it's gonna, that's what it's gonna push off to the, uh, the Gatekeeper control here. Um, all right, makes sense. So cool. All right, I think we're ready to deploy. Let's see if this thing works. Um, Again, we usually know. I, I usually know how well TGIK is going to go if uh, if the deployment works the first time. <laughs> That's usually my best uh, my best thing. So, um, okay, I'm going to switch over to my terminal here. So let's do that. And let me just remind myself real quick. I know you can't see my editor. My screen namespace gatekeeper system. Okay, so we'll do get po uh, namespace gatekeeper system. Yeah, you're right. Uh, okay, cool. Gatekeeper system, cool. So let's keep a watch on that. Um, no resource found. Okay, and then let's apply it. So we've got cube, cuddle, apply, gatekeeper, YAML. No objects passed to apply. All right, Josh, what the heck did you do? Um, gatekeeper, YAML. Oh, there's no objects in there. Again, Getting used to VS Code, I think I forgot to hit save maybe. <laughs> Let's see what we got. So if I look at that, there, that looks like it's got something. Okay, cool. Here we go, moment of truth. Will Gatekeeper start for us? So there's the audit, by the way, and we've got the controller. So let's see, um, ah, thanks Rita. So audit does not enforce, only shows violations. That makes sense to me, um, cool. Ajay, there's a diagram. Cool. Yeah, if there's an arc diagram, that'd be killer. Um, we should put it uh, in the HackMD if you got the link handy. That'd be that'd be killer. Hey, Olaf, thanks for joining us. Um, Oleg, I, I don't know if you're asking that just generically or if what I'm using, but I happen to be using Docker in this case um, for what it's worth. Uh, cool. Uh-oh. Image pull back off. Don't tell me we have a outage in what we're pulling the image from. Let's see. <laughs> that would be pretty hilarious, wouldn't it? Cube cuddle, get pods. Um, oh, YAML, namespace. Wait, actually, what am I doing here? I need to describe a pod. All right, so let's, uh, let's get the pods one more time. Cool, we'll actually do this real quick. So we'll get the pods and we've got an image pool back off. 
All right, and we will describe the pods. So kubectl describe pod namespace gatekeeper system. Um, let's see here. So we've got describe pod namespace gatekeeper system controller. Okay. Image pool back off. Oh boy, Quay. What's going on? Please don't tell me you're down again. <laughs> How hilarious. I think they might have heard us talking about Quay earlier in the episode, and we've totally screwed ourselves. Um, all right, let's let's hope that's not the case. So I'm just gonna, for freshness sake, let's go ahead and do a cube cuddle. Get all right, let's do a delete. And by the way, uh Quay was down for quite a few hours last time. So if anyone knows where these images are other than Quay, you know, feel free to do some back channeling real quick. Um, but let's let's just hope this is a, a one-off thing. Cube cuddle delete. Delete. Uh, cube cuddle delete F. And this is the gatekeeper YAML. And worst case, we could uh, we could always go look at gate or sorry, uh, conf test because I have that locally while we're uh, while we're waiting for it looks like Duff's on it to upload elsewhere. Um, all right. So um, did the, by the way, everyone did the Quay status page say anything helpful? Just out of curiosity. Um, let's see. Let's see. I will switch over to. Oops. Quay status page. Okay, they say everything's operational, but you all are saying you're getting 500. So it looks like, yeah, a couple of you are maybe getting a backup container image. So <laughs> feel free to uh, to shoot me alternative uh, image repos, and I will I will swap them out, no problem at all. Um, cool. All right. Well, I'm I'm glad we're all broken. That makes me feel a lot better. Um, like Joe said, yeah, a registry being down is something we uh, we don't very commonly uh, commonly worry about, but. All right, let's see what we got going on here. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay off Quay for a second. If anyone gets other news, please don't hesitate to shoot me a message in chat. Um, yeah, and don't send me uh, Bitcoin Bitcoin mining images because I'm running on my own hardware and you'll have to pay my electric bill if you send me that. So um, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna trust the image that I get from uh, uh, I guess Lockie or Duffy here, whoever uh gets it gets to it first um okay so let's talk actually let's talk a little bit about constraint templates because maybe we can tee it up and and get gatekeeper up here without pivoting too much so oh boy sorry uh constraint templates okay so again constraint templates are something i conceptually grok and i'm really stoked to try this out because it seems like a pretty cool model now constraint uh the constraint framework is part of opa this isn't only unique to Gatekeeper as I understand it. But what this, what's really interesting about this is it enables you to set up a policy and then feed that policy um, some parameters or data during evaluation. So what I really dig about this um, is let's let's start let's start bottom up here. Here's the target, right? So we have got a um, we've got a OPA policy here, and this is what we were just looking at in VS Code, right? It's got some Rego. Again, it it expresses some things. You can see here, it's using that better syntax we talked about. So it's setting a variable called provided, a variable called required, a variable called missing, and then at the end here, it does an evaluation, an assertion, if you will, right, uh, where it expects missing to not be greater than zero, so nothing is missing, right? Um, and then if it needs to fail and send this message back, right, it'll let us know, hey, you need to provide uh, the labels, okay? So what, where this kind of goes another step is it's, it's kind of hard to go in at times and manage uh, you know, these, these groups of labels. And also you might want to do it in more of a cube, Kubernetes native way. So what the constraint templates do is they actually let you define a net new CRD to support the policy. Now, this would introduce another CRD, so there is kind of that trade-off to think about. But basically what we're able to do here is say, here's a new CRD. It looks like in this case, they're calling the CRD Kate's required labels. And 
then what you'll be able to do is actually set instances of these required label objects that will then be evaluated in the policy. So to try to bring that full circle, um, here's an example of that. So once you put this constraint template in place, we're then able to go in and say, okay, cool. Uh, here is a label parameter for gatekeeper, right? And uh, we can add on to this, this array so that the policy can be defined in one area and then the injection of the labels we care about can be put in another area, which is a pretty interesting model. Like working with a lot of orgs that I've worked with with Kubernetes, like the whole policy administration thing is a little tough. I could see this being really beneficial. Um, again, I've never tried it in real life before, but um, it seems like a, a pretty interesting model here as well. Um, cool. So it looks like some folks are working on, yeah, Paul, it's uh, DSLs or uh, DSLs inside of YAML. It's always the best, right? Um, cool. Okay, cool. So it looks like y'all are still getting the image sorted out. Let me, let me give one more plug uh, for Gatekeeper here and we'll see if you all can beat me before I'm done talking. So another, another really interesting thing about Gatekeeper, and I actually want to use this as an example today, is that they have started setting up a couple libraries um, yeah, a couple libraries with just some policies you can kind of look at. And one of the po one of the policy libraries they put together is a pod security policy library. Now, this is super super interesting. Um I I've gotten mixed wording about the direction of PSPs overall. Um so I'm not going to comment on it. Um I don't really have a strong feeling about it either. But uh in case you're not aware, there's these things called PSPs or pod security policies. And it's one of those entry admission controllers I was telling you a little bit about where you can uh, turn it on in the API server. It actually has its own flag. So if we went into uh, this, this one again, right, we could go in here and turn pod security policies on by saying pod security policy, saving up my API server, right? I'm going to undo that before I accidentally save it. And then have PSPs enabled. And PSPs are oftentimes thought of as like a sometimes overlooked, but very, very necessary um, security thing to do for Kubernetes because it makes sure certain containers don't run as root. Certain containers don't attach to the host path and then like can set up static containers in the kubelet and take over everything. They can't attach to the host network, right? It's able to go in and basically say, hey, um, you know, are, are you allowed to do this thing, right? Now, what's interesting about the PSP library, and, and I'm, I'm stoked to kind of test this out today with you all and see if we can get like maybe some of these working, is that PSPs are great, but I think I'm speaking for most of the population when I say the user experience or UX on them is pretty rough. And I'm not saying that's anyone's fault. It's just like when you pair all these complex things together, it's a little bit rough around the edges and people have a hard time understanding it. Um, what's interesting about the validating webhook control is that if we can take the PSP concepts and put them up front in this very simple admission control, um, some of the UX could get better. Like one of the things I like about this is with PSPs a lot of the times, you'll go and you'll submit a deployment, right? And then you'll that deployment will instantiate many pods that run as root, okay? So I go in and I deploy my deployment and then I'm happy camper. Then all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, why am I not receiving traffic? What the heck is going on? And nine times out of 10, when I work with orgs who have PSPs turned on, we go in, assuming they just turned PSPs on, and we go in and we realize the pod is not starting, okay? Um, and then we look in it and we look into it and it's because the PSP was not, a, was not allowing that pod to run as root, which is great, but the user didn't know until they went in to kind of troubleshoot it. So what's cool about this, uh, this webhook model is I'm hoping when I submit with cube cuddle, it will realize, Hey, Josh, you're trying to run as root. It'll push right back and, and tell me as the user, even though I'm submitting a deployment through, Hey, I looked inside of the spec of your deployment and these containers aren't going to be allowed in here. Right. So it's kind of interesting. I do see some trade offs here. I don't really know how this all works. Like one trade off I have in my head. I don't know if this is an actual problem is like uh, actually run as root is a great example. Sometimes the container image natively sets you as a non root user. Right. And PSP is capable of understanding this. So when you submit the pod, even if you're not setting a non root user, if the pod is going to start with a non root user due to the um, 
due to the image that's stamped out, right? Like like Bitnami has an image for Nginx, for example, and it does this. It uses a non-root user by default. Um, the pod will still be allowed to start because it's a non-root user. I'm curious if this upfront mutating webhook model would know that. It seems like it would have to know purely based on the spec, right? of whether you're running as a non-root user or not. Now, there's totally arguments in both directions here. Like maybe we all should be explicitly calling out what user we're running as, right? But again, it kind of shows how like PSP has this like super deep kind of integration and validation. And on the other hand, this sounds really cool and like a way better UX, but I wonder I wonder where the gaps are there, like the like the root user concept. So, okay. And just when I'm about to shut up, Duffy has uh, a new, a new uh, thing for me. So let's let's see if I can switch over to MCR here. Shout out MCR for saving the day, huh? Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna go to my. Uh, okay, Josh, where are you at? Okay, here we are. So let's find every spot we have Quay. Hey, by the way, before I go too crazy, can someone validate Quay real quick? Are you still getting 500s? Could someone run a quick command and just let me know? Not that I have anything against MCR, but like before mutating this manifest, if we don't have to, um, why not not do it? Um, okay, MCR OSS. I'm, I'm assuming the names are the same, but maybe I shouldn't assume that actually. Uh, yeah, it's not the same. Okay, let me let me copy the whole. Wait, no, it is the same, isn't it? Okay, MCR. So it should just be prefixing MCR with OSS. Okay, thanks for checking in on. Um, Oh, cool. Sweet, Duffy. I'm going to assume you're not, uh, you're not mining me and I'm just going to use that. Okay. So we'll keep, we'll keep this one as is since it's the one on the GitHub. Uh, maybe we need an issue after this to move. Uh, I shouldn't say it, but maybe to move off of Quay because, um, we can't, we can't let future TGIKs go down like this. Okay. So I'm going to apply Duffy's thing blindly and, and pretend that I trust him. We've worked together Duffy now, what, for like three, four years maybe. So I guess I should be able to randomly apply something you sent me from the internet um okay so let's do get pods gatekeeper system okay let's set a watch here huh all right and oh that's not it that's a youtube link all right let's see duffy you gave me a gist here which i'm gonna grab and here we go cube cuddle apply f all right, gatekeeper take two. Here we go. This would be a pretty good recovery if we uh, if we succeed. Oh boy, it's maybe looking promising, huh? Yeah, I've never noticed your Bitcoin mining before. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Microsoft team for, for coming in and, and saving the day with that. That's super awesome of you. Um, we have a running gatekeeper now. Okay, uh, good job, everyone. That's killer. All right. Well, see, and, and they say these things are interactive and it's true because uh, you all just saved my butt from not being able to actually try this thing out. So great job. So let's remind ourselves where we're at since we've done a lot of context switching here. Um, uh, bah, 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 bah. Where are, you? Where are you, Josh? All right, here you are. Great. All right, so we are at a point where we have Gatekeeper right here, like we talked about. And we are going to be applying some policy to see if Gatekeeper can essentially um, validate that policy. So what do you say? Let's, let's, let's go right in with PSPs. Forget it. I, I want to do PSPs bad. We're going to do PSPs. I just want to see what it's like, okay? So no, darn it, Josh, what the heck did you just do? Uh, okay. That was not expected. Let's get back to the gatekeeper repo. Um, that's conf test. This is gatekeeper. All right. And they have a library. Um, and if we haven't already, let's put the library in the notes. Um, this is, this is really cool that they're starting to collect some of these. Um, okay. So back to pod security policy as our first example. So it looks like what they've got broken up here is the different, yeah, okay, the kind of different checks you would do. Um, we should do users since we talked a little bit about that. So um, they've got the Rego, which I'm guessing is just the raw Rego, customize, example, constraint. Okay, great. Let's start with the template. 
All right, perfect, yep. So this is one of those constraint templates. Let's bring it into VS Code and, and look at it real quick so we can grok um, what I was kind of getting at here. So uh, in manifest, I will do uh, user templates. I'll just say user.yaml, keep it super descriptive. Um, we'll paste that in, we'll save that in. We'll go back to the top. Um, awesome, okay. So this is a constraint template. And again, going from the bottom up, like we talked about, there is Rego inside of this CRD, okay? Um, and by the looks of it, uh, it's doing, well, let, let's come back to the actual logic in a second. But along with the, the Rego itself, it looks like it is defining a new CRD. So here's my expectation. When we, ex when we apply this constraint, temp this constraint template, I expect to see a net new CRD called Kate's PSP allowed users. Again, the concept here is let's put the core logic in the constraint template, and then let's allow you to fuel that template on the basis of a list of allowed users that you specify. And I think that's a really cool decoupling there. I can see from an administrator perspective how that would be super, super rad. All right, so let's see if my if my theory is correct, right? So we'll just watch kubectl get CRDs to start off with maybe here. Um, oh, geez, I've already got a lot. Okay, so I dig it. I, I don't know how I feel about... Um, I don't know how I feel about having tons and tons of CRDs just for each constraint template, but again, everything has trade-offs. So let's just let's just roll with it for now. So kubectl apply. Um, oh, sorry, everyone. Thanks for reminding me on the editor view. Uh, here we are. Okay. So in the bottom here, I have my CRDs listed. In the top here, I have kubectl apply, and we're going to apply manifest. Oh, I'm in manifest. We're going to apply user.yaml. So let's see if the Kate's PSP allowed users shows up here. Something popped up. There it is. Okay. So in theory, I've put a constraint template in now, and I've now got the ability to fill in the PSP allowed users, which makes some amount of sense to me. So now let's take a quick look in the cluster. So we've got kubectl get constraint template for the namespace um, gate keeper system. Great. Okay. So we've got this in here. We've got the constraint template. Now let's go back to the browser and let's take a quick look at the, um, the constraint. There it is. So here's a constraint. Ah, I dig it. Okay. Let's, let's pull this in. All right. So from a constraint perspective, we're going to be looking at uh, a, a range. It looks like between users 100 and 200. So this will be our, um, our constraint.yaml. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Duffy. I know I should use bash completion. I think I like the pain of not having it though. Um, so, <laughs> so this is the thing that we're going to feed in. Note that this is one of those custom CRDs. So again, the beauty here is based on our organization and, and what our needs are, we now can tune this thing independent of the logic. So in theory, I can come in here and change some of these, <laughs> some of these values around, right? Um, like maybe I just don't want zero. So the range is going to look slightly different. Um, so yeah, um, this is this is it, and and it also looks like actually this is interesting too. I don't I don't grok this completely, but it is this somehow scoping the constraint template to say like, hey, only or maybe like start in the pod spec. I'm trying to I'm trying to grok it because if I submit a deployment YAML, I'm trying to understand how this match field right here, right, um, kind of kind of evaluates. In fact, we could probably answer that question real quick. If we look in the logic, the Rego goes through. Okay. So here, okay, here's what's cool. So this looks different, right? Input.parameters. So I'm thinking that input.parameters probably comes from our constraint. Yes. Okay. Here's the parameters for our constraint, right? And then it's going in here and it's looking up that rule. Um, and then Oh, interesting. Input underscore container. So is that being defined? 
how does it know what input underscore, oh, maybe input underscore container is being captured higher up. Input parameters, run as rule, input containers. This line right here is confusing me a little bit actually. So maybe chat, you can tell me. Oh, input is the pods. Well, input is the, I get that input is the pod spec, but why? Why input seems to have two fields on it now, right? Like in, in, in raw vanilla Rego, I'd expect input dot some field on my data. And now with the constraint, I've got input dot parameter, right? So where am I calling like input dot spec dot blob dot blah? It seems to be some kind of implicit assumption about the input container. Which I'm trying to uh, trying to think. Let's see here. I should check chat. This evaluates the pod objects regardless of how you deployed it, whether it's part of deployments, jobs. Okay, so yeah, I dig that, Rita. That makes a lot of sense because then I can scope it. And like you said, I get to, and this was my complaint about you know conventional PSPs. I get to apply this to the pod spec regardless of whether it's coming through a stateful set, uh, deployment, um, you know, a job, whatever, whatever it might be. So I dig that a lot. Um, it's the same as the admission. You can parse through that object in your Rego. Interesting. Yeah, I think so. Okay, let me let me be super succinct about where I'm getting hung up. Where is this value coming from? I think that's the only thing I can't quite grok here. Input underscore container. Um, I'm probably overlooking something super obvious, but it sounds like in chat you all might be grokking it. So let's just, let's try to apply this thing and see if it works. So I'm going to do a cube cuddle, uh, switch over to my terminal real quick. Um, we'll do a cube cuddle apply for the user YAML. Okay. Um, Kate's PSP. Oh no, sorry. That was the, I need the constraint YAML this time, right? So we'll do the constraint. All right. We've got the constraint in good deal. Now, what happens if we try to add an object? So if we go back to the browser here, I think they had an example pod, which I will happily take. Okay. So run as user 250. Okay, so this is out of the range, right? Because our range was 100 to 250. Um, so let's just go back here and... I'm going to cheat for a moment for the sake of quickness. So nginx.yaml. Let's go ahead and, oops. I don't have my NeoVim mapped in my Vim slot. Okay. So now we'll do kubectl apply f nginx yaml. So before I get too deep on that one, just to make sure we're all on the same page, what we're doing here is we're applying an nginx yaml where the run as user is set to 250 in the security context. And our constraint here is between these ranges, right? So I would hope it will bounce back and be like, hey, Josh, can't do that thing, right? So um, if we go in and apply it, there it is. And this is, again, why, let's go back to the terminal. Sorry, everyone. Um, this is exactly why this is a really, really cool model from a UX perspective, right? Um, as the user, I'm hit back instantly saying, hey, Josh, um, you're not allowed to run as user 250. And that's a really, really clear message for me, which I, which I dig a lot. Um, so this is, uh, this is pretty cool. Um, you know, like I had mentioned, I think what's interesting, actually, let's, let's try this out real quick, just for the heck of it. So what's kind of interesting is if we go back to the, um, Nginx YAML real quick, and let's say that we, Let's say that we do the Bitnami Nginx image for just a second here. Um, Cause I know that one doesn't run as root by default. I just want to validate that my, my concern about some of like the lower level details would still be there. So Bitnami Nginx uh, container image, right? So Bitnami Nginx container image. And if we grab this, so I know for a fact that this container image, don't hate me for using latest, I'm just gonna do it. This container image is going to use, right, going to use Bitnami Nginx latest. 
Um, so this does not need, in my case, a security context because I know for a fact this will run as non-root. So if we come back to the, uh, now I've got too many editors going on. If we say the min is one and the max is, I guess this won't actually matter because it probably will fail just because I'm not specifying the run as user. I'd be willing to bet it's that simple, right? So let's let's just make sure that I'm I'm making a logical a logical statement here. So if I do cube cuddle and I apply the constraint YAML, um, now it's configured. And then if I cube cuddle apply the nginx YAML, I actually didn't need to make this that intricate, right? Because all I really needed to do here, right? So I've applied the constraint YAML. And then if I go in and apply the uh, nginx YAML, I'm thinking, oh, it worked. Huh, that's interesting. I have no idea why it would work. Huh, user, let's see. So the range, does it know the user that the container image is using? Yeah, I see that it applied. Maybe my concern about that's not valid. Um, I think it's running. Unless, unless something about my ranges, unless I screwed something up with the ranges here, I don't know. Here, let's just, let's go back to this. Cause my thought process here is that it should just fail regardless because I'm not setting it, right? So if we just do cube cuddle plot, oh, you know what I, no, actually that shouldn't matter. Okay, never mind. Constraint YAML, let's apply that. So it's configured, okay? And then if I just check my Nginx image one more time, I am not setting a user or security context user, I should say. And I will apply Nginx YAML. Ah, and it works. Interesting. Is that a? Is there any chance that's a bug in the policy? Um, I just I, unless it's just magically capable. Because <laughs> um, then my thought process would be if I came in here and said, yeah, I did save this, the constraint, Steve. I I triple checked that. Um, cube cuddle. Maddie said cube cuddle get pod. I think it should just let it go, Maddie, because I don't have PSPs on. So if I come here and I say, I mean, here's a good way to check it. I'm just going to bring the security context back in real quick um, and see. Um, either it's a bug or you're freaking blowing my mind right now, gatekeeper. Um, NVim. Yeah, Reed, I can show the constraint again. No problem. Let me just update the Nginx thing real quick before I forget. Um, actually, you have the constraint in front of you. So I've got the constraint ranges set to 100 and 200. So if I came back here and said, um, so what? What? Here, here's my guess. To be super honest with you, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I might be wrong, but I'm guessing that um, the again. Remember how we're talking about how Rego is kind of confusing because, like, if something evaluates as false, it, it doesn't work. So maybe the lack of existence of that thing, it's not breaking the way that it should. That's probably, I, I think that's maybe what we're running into here. Um, so if I just change this back to 250, right? I just wanna make sure it's still, it's still, it's still failing on that case, because that case it should fail. So if I apply uh, the constraint one more time, just to make sure it's saved, okay? Um, and then apply Nginx again. Oh, it's a pod. Cube cuddle, delete, nginx yaml. Wait, what am I doing? Okay. Don't kill me. No autocomplete. Okay. So here we go. One more. Um, my cluster's slowing down, of course. Okay. It's deleted. Give it a sec. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the same page, Steve. I would think you can't check something that's not there. Yeah, so I mean, that, that would be the point though, Steve. So if like, if it's not there and it still goes through, then it probably should be failing, I would think, right? Because um, if you think about running this at an org, if I was a user and just had to not include the security context in that way, that would be a thing. Yeah, now it's failing. Okay, so not gonna say for sure, but we might we might have helped out just finding a little tiny little nit that needs to happen, no big deal, um, where somewhere inside of this, the lack of existence of the uh, the security context is probably letting it pass, which it probably shouldn't. Um, so, uh, in Duffy, I did check the uh, it, the constraint itself is scoped on the pod, and the validating webhook for what it's worth 
is watching all objects for create and update. So it's not just limited to deployments or anything like that. So yeah, I think, I think somewhere in here, again, like I said, um, it probably needs to have a check that says something like, actually, maybe we could do it. Um, I'm a little, I'm still confused by that input container thing. Oh, these are functions. Okay, okay. Ah, all right. So these input containers are functions. So check this out. Uh, check this out. Let's let's see if we could do this. This would be kind of cool, right? So um, what would we need to do here? So input container is going into the review object and into the containers. Okay, that makes sense to me. So, and then if I, where do I check input containers, not run as a user? Oh, it's calling a function there, huh? Okay, security, ooh, that's it. That's it though. So input container security context. What if we did something like this, where we said um, input container security context. So not set, right? Is that, does that make sense to everyone? Let me know if I'm doing something stupid here. Input container dot security context. So if it's not there, if it's, <laughs> see, this is where Rego always gets me mixed up. If it's not there, it's going to evaluate as true, which we don't want. So we want wait why is my brain getting so mixed up now if if it is here it will evaluate it, okay if it's not there in this case it would evaluate as false right but you you all think the not will work or should the not go away i'm i'm getting myself mixed up now i think but let's let's try it anyway so we'll do the we'll do the constraint um here so what what do you all think about this not input user Wally, do you think not should go away? I kind of think so too, because like, I think we want this to evaluate as false if not is there. Um, all right, Josh, where the heck did you just put that? <laughs> there it is, okay. So not input security context. Uh, not, oh, I should just look at the next rule. If it's not run as user, Yeah, yeah, I think you're all right. It should be without not, right? Now, question for you all. I, I can't remember my Rego syntax offhand. Is this a good enough expression, or do I need to say something like not null or exists or something like that? Does any does anyone remember offhand? I'd If you can save me from going into the, the OPA docs, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, okay, so let's see if I can even apply this. So if I go back to the terminal here, we'll do a cube cuddle apply for the um, user YAML. Okay, so that reconfigured that. Um, cool. All right, so here's the logic I have. <laughs> let's, let's talk it over one more time if you're not exhausted by it. Uh, and by the way, s someone gut check me here. If, if I need to say something like exists or something, I can't remember what the, the syntax is, but maybe this maybe this is an expression in itself. I don't know. Um, would, this, would this statement here evaluate as true or false? Um, but the notion that I'm going with is I actually am checking for the existence of it. If it exists, oh, you know what? Not is right here. Because if it exists, it would be true. Oh, man. <laughs> This this logic is really is really making my brain wrap up into a wrap up into a whirlwind here. Um, I'm gonna start with not and see what happens. Um, so, long story short, if you're confused when you write Rego, don't worry. I'm confused too, but you'll get there. It's a really it's a really cool language. So um, let's let's just try both conditions. So um, we configured it again. Let's go back to Nginx. Let's take out the security context temporarily. Um, Okay, let's delete Nginx. Oh, there is no Nginx. Okay, so kubectl get pods. Great, okay. And then let's apply Nginx again. Okay, it worked. So that would, oh wait, no, that was the user, Nginx. Okay, it created. So the, the inverse, what we all thought was, was, uh, was correct initially was the right move. So I need, to, I need to make sure that security context is here. Um, so 
what is the what's what's the statement here steve you said has key What is the, uh, let's just let's look in the open doc, see if I can find it real quick. What I'm looking for here, everyone, is how do I check for the existence of a key? Does anyone remember? Um, OPA docs. If you specify something in it, it will deny. Um, what would an example of that be, Sirtec? Policy language. Let's see here. Um, exists are above oh so you're saying evaluate if it equals false just like some random value essentially so maybe something like equals equals um <laughs> dog uh, security context equals equals. Let's see. Oh, I guess if I specified, hmm. Yeah, well, that would return false anyways. What is the what is the assertion logic in OPA for checking if there's an existent key? That's what I want to figure out. Um, name equals prod. The rule R above asserts. Oh, Patrick, just input security context is sufficient okay maybe you're right then cool all right this this will be our last try and we'll we'll let it be after this if it doesn't work we'll let it be after this if it uh if it fails on us so input container security context all right so if security context is not there our hope is it'll evaluate false um which doesn't make sense to me still logically anywho all right here we go I'm, I'm not smart enough for Rego today, maybe another day. <laughs> so we'll do a cube cuddle, um, apply on the user YAML. So cube cuddle, apply on user. All right, we configured it. So it saw that change, that's good. Um, let's apply the constraint again, just for the heck of it too. Um, I did save this time, Duff, yes, I double checked. Um, we'll do the constraint YAML, unchanged, that's expected, all right. So let's delete Nginx real quick, and then let's see if this works. No, it, it didn't. Okay. So there's there's something going on here. Um, unfortunately, my, my Rego skill set's failing me, but I think uh, if I had more time to look in the docs and check it out, something about this line here could be expressed where if security context didn't exist, it would actually fail. Um, so I think that's... Uh, that's a that's a big one so um yeah so if anyone has any ideas though as far as like what that would be syntactically feel free to put it in chat we can come back to this one and look at it but long story short um we basically put a psp in place so that's kind of cool um if we look at uh let's go back to our our constraint here we'll look at our our objects in the terminal so we ended up with uh get let's see if i can find this real quick so kubectl get the constraint template. Actually, I wonder if I have this in my constraint. All right, my history is not shared, great. So kubectl get constraint template for the namespace gatekeeper system. So we put in this uh, constraint template uh, based on the, the PSP allowed users, right? And then we went in and we put in a constraint for a specific uh, specific CRD that we defined. You might remember that CRD was this thing right here. So Kate's PSP allowed users. So effectively, what we were able to do with the users here is to go in and specify, let's see here, um, to specify the constraint, which allows us to put in and kind of decouple the input as parameters. So this is really this is really sweet. Um, what, what do you think, chat? I think this is a really, really cool model. It's super interesting. Like we said, you're introducing a new CRD, so something to think about. And, and you could theoretically be introducing many new CRDs, right? But decoupling kind of this this thing with Gatekeeper is, is really nice. I, I really dig it a lot. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty sweet. Um, Okay, so, all right, Waleed, you made a suggestion about what that might be. I'll be, will, I'll be willing to give that one more shot. I'm, I'm stubborn enough to, to try one, one last time. 
So if we go back to user, and then we go back to the security context and actually turn it into an expression, and I'll use the double equals here to be ultra clear. Input container security context run as non root equals equals true. All right, um, so let's save that up. Let's go back to our constraint here and apply it again. So this will be the user YAML. We'll delete the nginx pod and then see if I have any luck for a kind of final try. It worked. No, it didn't. No, <laughs> never mind. I did the wrong thing. I read a longer message than pod created and got too excited there, huh? Um, apply. No, nope, still didn't work. Okay, I'm giving up on that. So what else do we got going on here? Um, so going back to Gatekeeper for a moment, I, I want to wrap up on some of the, the cool stuff here that it's, it's got going on and then spend a little bit of time talking about conf test before we end for the day. Um, so we deployed Gatekeeper. Pretty freaking cool, huh? Um, it was extremely easy to set up, by the way, which was which was really sweet. So kudos to the team working on that. Um, we apply just some random policy from the library, and we're effectively able to validate PSPs. And there's nothing stopping me from just continuing on and on and on, going through all these different PSPs, right? Um, so I could just keep adding them in and adding them in. They've also got a general section in the library. It looks like with some more uh, some more cool cases, like you know the one that we're oftentimes working with is uh, the required labels use case. Get this all the time, like. Organizationally, I want to make sure there's always these labels. Um, you know, I want to make sure everyone there's an owner label that tells me the email address of the person to contact if something bad happens. You know, all those kind of uh, policy things. So, um, this is a great example of where the constraint template I think is super cool. Um, which uh, this is the one that was in the README, isn't it? So, this uh, specifies the violation, sees if there's any missing ones out of the required ones, right? And uh, we'll check to see if there's violations. And then, like we said, we can put the constraint in place, which will actually allow us to put in, oh, this is cool. So in one, in one uh, example, we saw it'll let us put in a list of the labels. And then in this one, it's also got a cool one where it's actually injecting the allowed regex. So maybe you want to like namespace scope all your labels. So that's a, a great, a great situation. So any label that's from our company, we want to make sure has agile bank .demo prefixing it. Uh, before we kind of let it uh, let it fail there, so um, or before we allow it in, I should say. So really cool stuff. What do you all think? This is a this is a really sweet tool. I will definitely be testing it out in some more serious environments going forward. Um, I don't think we'll have time today to call it out, but I just want to mention it because Rita had given us some good context on it. There is a whole nother controller in here, right? Um, that is doing audit, which is really sweet. So like the ability to go in and kind of retroactively check if there's anything that wouldn't comply with these existing pieces, okay? So uh, so that's that's kind of an interesting one. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Uh, feel free, uh, Microsoft Team too, if you have any uh, any curiosities or things you want to call out. It looks like they've got some tracing functionality that you can turn on. So maybe if i had done my homework and read ahead we could have traced to see where that where that psp piece was was maybe going wrong but i think we're on to it we just need to figure it out syntactically um, and then i think there's a way in here too where you can get some initial uh, some other data from like the kubernetes cluster if you want where is that at like imagine if you were like trying to evaluate something and you needed to make a decision based on other settings or data in the kubernetes cluster um, where is that at constraints maybe it's lower down um, do, do, do. what do we got customizing and mission behavior yeah I don't know if you know what it's called offhand Rita I might be scrolling over it but I'm thinking like what if I wanted to know whether I should allow like an ingress rule based on what other ingress rules are already being used in the cluster right if that makes any sense Exempting namespaces. Oh, this is cool. So we can exempt certain, this is awesome. Yeah, exempting certain namespaces from the admission webhook. So maybe like our operations namespace, right? We wanna kind of keep that out. Um, referential constraints. Okay, let me see if I can find that. Referential <laughs> constraints. I don't know if I'm spelling referential wrong. Um, constraints. Yeah, I don't, I'm not seeing the readme, but I think there, I think I saw something around this. So you all should check it out if you wanna kind of, check out some of these different pieces so 
pretty cool. Um, okay. Yeah, this is this is really awesome. So great work, everyone involved in Gatekeeper. It was super, super cool to check this thing out. I'm, I'm really excited to keep trying this. Um, I do want to wrap up with a little bit around conf test real quick, because this is another big one that I see in the ecosystem and I've, I've actually used a little bit at this point. Um, so from a conf test perspective, this is our ability to go in and uh, kind of use like a command line like tool to run these Rego expressions. Now, the first question I have, I don't know if anyone knows offhand, having come from Gatekeeper now and somewhat really starting to fall in love with constraint templates, does anyone know if there's work happening with conf test to maybe support this constraint template model? I'm trying to think if like, because it would be really cool if there was a way to kind of interact between the two. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, I think if you're, if you're doing the constraint temp template model, it wouldn't be too hard to just do like native Rego policy, but if there's a way to kind of manage one source and use it in conf test and gatekeeper, that could be really cool. Um, sweet. Oh, Rita said that that's interest in the community. Yeah, I would, I would love to see that, especially, I mean, as Gatekeeper gets more adoption, it totally makes sense. Um, okay, let's talk conf test real quick and wrap up for the day. What do y'all say? So conf test, it's a command line tool. It lets us run Rego policy. Um, you might remember from before I had showed you uh, some good old Rego inside of here. And this is basically the kind of stuff we can use conf test with, with right? In fact, um, Steve, one of our longtime listeners, hit me up because he has a repo of policies. Um, I put them in the reference links. Let's let's try one of these with conf test real quick. So, uh, oops, that's not the right link. Uh, so cleverly named deprecation. So um, I looked at it very briefly, but what it looks like it does is Steve's put together some policies that are going to allow you to um, go in and uh, and kind of check to see whether you're compliant. And it looks like Duffy put another link in too. So maybe there's a couple deprecate uh, deprecate things. So excuse me if I'm not <laughs> up to speed with with what the different ones are. But since you're listening today, Steve, we're gonna we're gonna plug you and try one of yours out. Okay. I don't know if this is a fork or if this is a custom made one. Um, what the deal is. But anywho, let's try it. So. Uh, these are, again, more conventional looking policies, right? So these probably look more familiar to all of us who have done Rego work. We are essentially putting together these warning messages. Now, um, again, keep in mind with Rego, warning has arbitrary meaning. This could say banana or puppy, right? But warn and error uh is it no warn and, is it warn and deny? I can't remember with conf test now. But uh, warn and error or deny are actually interpreted by conf test, right? So it's able to know like, oh, what this person put here is a warning, right? And then in deny case, it can interpret that as an error. So again, the key thing is this is not meaningful to Rego, but it's meaningful to the tool that wraps OPA, in this case, conf test, to actually give you legitimate results back, which I, which I find pretty cool. So let's, uh, let's, grab this, uh, let's grab this one and see if we can make something happen, huh? And then we'll, we'll wrap up on that. So uh, let's go ahead and paste it on in. Okay, and great. So key thing we got going on here, right? warn message uh so we're going to run uh some checks and inside of here there's a couple implementations that are letting us know that we have potentially got things that are no longer compliant so uh the reason that uh i like the notion of constraint templates is what i'm kind of seeing here and, and rita and steve and, and everyone else you can keep me honest but like this model could be really cool in a constraint template, right? Because what you could do is you could just simply put the logic that is effectively checking the API version relative to the kind. And then in a separate constraint, you could then define all the logic that you all have here, which would be super, super slick, right? Um, so that over time, rather than updating OPA policies, you're actually updating the constraint to the constraint template. So again, even this example with conf test speaks to the, the interesting aspects of that constraint template model. Um, but nonetheless, it looks pretty simple. We're going through, uh, we're checking to see if, um, if we're using old versions of an API and that's it. So looks pretty cool to me, huh? So let's, let's see if we can make this thing work. So conf test is a command line tool. 
And probably what I should get is I should get an ingress object and then change the API version. That, that seems like a pretty good plan, right? So let's do Kubernetes, ingress, YAML file. Okay, and then we'll grab ingress. And ingress is now part of the kind ingress. It's no longer in that extensions subcategory. So if we go back to the VS Code editor and we add in the ingress, oops, wrong window, everyone, sorry, ingress.yaml, and we paste this in. All right, so we'll test the happy path first, and then we'll test the failure path. So in theory, keep me honest here, I think that this should pass with conf test. So if I run conf test uh, with this policy, we should be good. Now, um, conf test has, I think by default, this notion of looking in a policy directory, so I need to go in and make dir policy, and then I need to move the manifest. Where did I put that policy? What the heck did I call it? Um, oh boy, let's see. Let's let's see if we can find this thing. Uh, it was literally called policy.rego. Okay, uh, which was in the root system, right? So. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I think we need to do this to pick it up by default without any additional flag. So we're going to put policy.rego in the policy thing. And then here is the command line tool, conf test. Um, now, I, I guess I, I really should give a plug here. I know we're, we're running low on time, but um, conf test is freaking awesome. Um, this person, who I can never pronounce uh, their name correctly, I always say Gareth. I hope I'm saying it somewhat correctly. He does really cool stuff, um, or they do really cool stuff in the sense that, like, if, if you've ever used, like, the Kubernetes, uh, the YAML language server from Red Hat, it, if you look under the hood of the code, it's using um, some YAML schemas that uh, this person has written, or this person's company, I don't know who owns it, but has written automation to generate those schemas and host them. So some of that work is actually what's giving us like Kubernetes auto completion in VS Code and Vim through the through the Red Hat language server. And uh, his uh, their work on conf test has just been freaking killer. Uh, so much so that now, and I think this might have even happened this week. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it uh, it's now part of the Open Policy Agent. So uh, there's a couple of things with conf test that I won't get into today. But just to call out, one of the really cool things is these policy bundles we make. It lets you package them up and push them out to a registry. So like we were talking with Harbor 2.0, um, you know, theoretically, <coughs> excuse me, if you haven't already, Steve, you can take all of these the, all of these policies, bundle them up, and then just literally push them out to a registry. And then me as a user, I can come in here, right? And I can run a conf test pool, and it will actually pull down the bundle of policy that you know, someone like Steve or someone else had set up and actually let me run them to validate whether things went wrong. So that is such a freaking cool model, especially if you're at your organization and you want developers to be able to pull down predefined policy. Really, really neat, right? So um, I, I do dig I do dig that model a lot. Okay, enough talking. Shut up, Josh. Let's uh, let's actually try this out, right? Um, so uh, and I should I should show real quick. Conf test uh, help. So this is the command line tool, and this is the pool command I was talking about, by the way. So, you know, in theory, they could also push the bundle up as well, which is super rad. All right, let's do this thing. So conf test. Uh, uh, now I'm forgetting what the, okay, conf test test. So it'll be conf test test. And then, like I said, I think it'll pick up the policy automatically. And then if I just do the file now for ingress, which I put in ingress. Okay, so far so good. So I ran this test um, based on deprecation and I have two tests, two tests passed. Let's see if we can see what tests would have passed here. Um, okay, actually we can tell pretty easily. So clearly this one would have passed, right? Because this would have come in and evaluated, right? And then this one up here would have come in and evaluated as well. Now let's break things. So theoretically, oh, sorry, I, I'm, I should be showing you my, my editor, my bad. I need to go back to Vim so I don't have to switch through so many screens. Um, so now I need to basically set the ingress object to use this extension v1 beta, okay? So let's go in and do that. We'll go to ingress. We'll go up to, uh, 
Where is my, okay, here we go. So we will change the API version. Um, and sorry, I, I, I think I misspoke earlier. It's inside of networks.kates.io now, and it used to be inside of extensions, which is where we're effectively gonna put it. So let's let's get rid of this. Oh boy. There we go. Okay, let's get rid of that. Let's get the uh, let's get the policy back. Policy rego. Let's get the extensions v1 beta. So I'll copy that out. Go to ingress. Let's put the API version here. Okay. So now, I'm a developer. I've been submitting ingress objects for months or years, and like I'm not really thinking about what's going to eventually happen when things get deprecated and then past deprecation potentially even getting removed. So why not have some checks in place that maybe warn me, right? So now that we've done this, we'll go back to our terminal and fingers crossed everyone, we have a failure. So as a developer, you know, be it in my CI system, be it maybe in Gatekeeper through admission control, right? I am able to be pushed back on and saying, hey, Josh, listen, it's in a different API group, you know, take the time to update the API group, right? You know, suck it up and, and get this done. So this is just an example of how amazing this stuff can be. And this expands to all of it. Like we were talking about how PSPs are like really reactive, right? Well, we could, even if we still wanted to use PSPs on the back end until like maybe gatekeeper PSP libraries mature over time, we could turn on PSPs on the back end, and then we could use the PSP library. It might need some refactoring again because it's uh, it's those, those templates, but we could use those in the command line tool here, which is super slick. So developers will know before they, you know, start you know feeling really bad because their workload's not running in the cluster. They'll know ahead of time, hey, you can't run this thing as root, right? Like, and, and those shoutouts will come to them with feedback. It's a really really slick model. Um, so you can kind of see how, how some of those bits work together. All right. Pausing for a moment. Everyone who's still with us, what do you think? Was this some pretty cool stuff? Can you see how this is, uh, these are some useful tools in your, in your kind of Kubernetes tool belt here? I definitely feel that way. It seems really, really slick. Um, yeah, pretty cool stuff, huh? So, yeah. So all in all, um, <laughs> we've, we've as, as my background implies, we've really climbed a mountain today from, not, from Quay being down to you know, getting things we haven't played with stood up. This was a really, really slick session. Um, you know, I think this ecosystem around Gatekeeper and OPA is looking really promising and I, I, can't, wait to, I can't wait to work in it more genuinely. Um, so with that being said, just as a reminder, I want to say, of course, Quay's back online now. Yeah. Um, I just want to say and remind everyone, all the diagrams, all the files you're seeing in this video, they will be committed today to GitHub. So if you do want to look at them or maybe you're like, oh yeah, that diagram where Josh was explaining that thing, you know, maybe I just want to like pull it up real quick and look at it. It's an, obviously not an amazing diagram, but it might remind you of something. It's all there. Um, all the files will be there as well. Right. So with that being said, everyone who's still with us, if you don't mind, maybe give a quick thanks to our Microsoft folks, um, Rita and Lockie, for sticking around and helping us out. Um, not only helping us with learning about Gatekeeper, but also saving our butts when we needed another registry. That's pretty freaking cool, right? And, uh, and thank you all for joining us. Um, this, was, this was a super slick episode. So uh, look for the commit in GitHub. We'll publish some more details on YouTube. And have a killer weekend, everyone. Stay safe out there. We'll see you at the next TGIK. See you later.